Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed your lunch. I know I did. Usually this is the point where I am uh, sat in a really interesting talk, desperately trying to keep my eyes open because I've had too good a lunch. So hopefully I'm not in that slot for you. Um, so I'm here today to talk about uh, open banking versus DeFi. Uh, and I'm really interested, first of all, who is here because of crypto? Stick your hands up. Let's have some hands. Oh, okay, less, less than I thought. Okay, less than I thought. Who's here for open banking? Because this is, this is a battle. Okay, no, there's a few people. There's a few people. Some faces I recognize as well, which is good. So, uh, so we're going to have a little bit of a, a face-off between open banking and DeFi today. Um, I will uh, spoil it at the start and say there's no winner. So if you were here for, for you know, egging on a certain side, sorry, uh, you're not going to come away happy about that. Uh, tell you a little bit about me first. So my name's Tom. Um, I've been at a consumer finance company for over five years um, in leadership roles. Before that, I was an engineer. Um, whilst I've been there, I've built an open banking platform. So, you know, I am Mr. Open Banking. That's my thing. Uh, but I also have that typical sort of technologist intro, interest in crypto. Uh, I find it really, really interesting and fascinating. I'm not in the, uh, the sort of crypto cult kind of class that you might come across. But I like to think I've got a bit of, a, bit of an interest. Um, and I have sold some NFTs, so I suppose you could call me um, a little bit more than a passing interest. Um, I didn't sell them for very much, so that's why I'm here and not on a beach, like a nice hot beach somewhere, uh, reveling in the, the much funds. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about open banking and DeFi um, and sort of think, talk a little bit about why, uh, why I think this is sort of a, it's a, more of a social thing than a technology thing and what it could mean for the future of, of technology, but uh, future of finance. But first, we probably need to talk a little bit about what finance really is and what it might be. So I've worked at a financial uh, services company, um, so I know what finance is. It's theoretically my job to know that. It's really important that I know that. Uh, but some people might not have done, so I thought I'd, I'd just do a little quick uh, brain teaser 101. So what is finance? Really simplistic view, you can divide it into three things, consumer finance, commercial finance, and sort of trading, which is your stocks and shares style stuff. Um, those first two are quite similar, and the main difference is between the two is like the amount of money involved. Naturally, commercial finance, there's a lot more money flowing around, you know, talking millions, billions, that kind of thing. Consumer finance, well, it'd be nice if someone would loan me a, a billion pounds, but I don't think that's going to happen, unfortunately. So within, within each of these sort of strands, there's all sorts of different concepts as well. There's the concept of loaning money, um, payments, uh, shifting finance, cash around in different ways, converting between different uh, assets and different uh, like, uh, uh, currencies and things like that. Um, trading is the one that sort of really stands out as separate. And, and this is the one where once you get onto crypto and blockchain, that's really where um, most people will be quite familiar with the, con uh, you know, the concepts of trading. Um, it's a whole different side of finance. So, how, and so let's carry on defining terms. Let's start with open banking. So open banking is very consumer finance focused. Um, it's very governance focused. It's, it's a piece of legislation. Um, we talk a lot about open banking in the technology side, but on the... The compliance side, the real, the real word is PSD2, which is a piece of legislation that came out of the European Banking Authority a few years ago, um, which really wanted to try and redefine sort of the, the, the payments ecosystem uh, across the finance sector. Um, and to understand what that means, you have to understand a little bit about how finance really works. And the truth is that there is a monopoly in finance, a really big monopoly, and it's held by Visa and MasterCard. Um, could get a bit preachy on this, so bear with me. Um, Visa and MasterCard, obviously, they own the monopoly because if you go and use your card for any kind of payment, Visa and or MasterCard are going to be involved somewhere along the line, unless you're the kind of person with an American Express card. Um, but they, they own such a huge segment of the market. And the reason that they've built that you know, monopoly in the market is largely because uh, they, there was a whole load of physical infrastructure that's at play. You've got your card, it's a physical thing. You've got the payment machine, it's a physical thing. Um, and this all predates you know, the internet as we know it today. So they have this huge monopoly that's persisted. They, monopolies always aim to uh, retain themselves. And so as we've gotten more digital payment standards and, and things like that, um, they've continued to, to extend their reach into these areas. And the whole point of PSD2, Payment Standards Directive, was to kind of 
try and unpick some of that monopoly and create some competition in the payments ecosystem by democratizing um, the, the, the payment space. So you can perhaps start to see where some of this is going now. That's where we got onto DeFi. So DeFi, cryptocurrencies, all of those, I kind of think about it as a, a finance counter counterculture, um, kind of like the, the anarchi anarch anarch anarchist, anarchist streak in me. Uh, quite likes the idea of, of DeFi. It's this idea that you know you don't have to have a whole ton of money to get into finance and to perhaps lend money or make money or create value. Um, it, it covers. It's not just compute, consumer finance. It covers trading. That's a really big part of crypto. Uh, it covers commercial finance. We're starting to see that as well now. Um, but but what is it? So. I was talking to someone actually who's um, one of the core developers at uh, sort of an Ethereum spin-off and he said actually if you think about it there's nothing novel in, in reality about blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies. A lot of the concepts go before the idea of a distributed ledger where we've all worked with cluster databases, really similar sorts of concepts, um, proof of work, uh, back when I first started out as an engineer folding at home was a thing, if anyone's heard of that, if you remember that used to run that on every computer you could find. That was effectively just a proof of work concept um, where you used to fold proteins, get a reward for doing so, and uh, you know, uh, prove that you'd done the work. So it's, uh, it, you know, these, are, these are not novel concepts, but I think the novelty comes from like it's done in the open um, and it's done in a way that people can start to contribute and be part of a wider public ecosystem. So right, let's compare and contrast and bring them together. Um, I'm going to go through four rounds. Like I say, there's not really going to be any winner here. Uh, I'm a bit of a sort of a thought experiment kind of person. So effectively, this is me turning my thought experiment from here into a few slides and then telling you all about it. Um, but it should hopefully be an interesting ride. We're going to look at, um, so how does it appeal to the consumer? You know, what, what, uh, what kind of interest is there around it? Um, how accessible is it? Uh, we're going to look at competition, like is there, does it create some real competition, does it create innovation in particular. Uh, standardization, always is a really cool one to look at, finding the balance between standardization and security, which is going to be a fun one for crypto, bless it. Uh, so how friendly is it? Consumer friendly is, it's a good place to start. Um, consumers are on average non-technical and only averagely financially savvy, and that sounds really, really mean, but it is really, really true. Uh, one of the things that I discovered working at a consumer finance company is that you have to lower your averages of understanding. And that's not because people are stupid in any way. It's because some of this stuff's really complicated. And when you work with it day to day, you have a really intrinsic understanding of it. I can tell you, for example, all of the modeling process that would be required for you to get a credit card. I bet very few people in this room would have that understanding. Um, and therefore, you're not financially savvy in that regard, right? So you have to always remember that. And finance is a really thorny subject as well. People are very sensitive about their money, where it's stored, where it's protected, how it's saved, who has access to it. Um, and they often feel this way about, about it because they don't really understand where it is. It's this kind of like this magic stuff there that sometimes that they can get access to. Um, which is why, interestingly, the complete aside, why uh, notes and, and cash money is taking a while to actually phase out because you know, is that under the bed scenario? If I've got it cold hard cash in my hand, it's a real thing. You know, someone can't take it away from me without me knowing about it. All right, so let's compare and contrast on this one. So DeFi, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, really high bar to entry. I am certainly no expert and I consider myself a pretty good technologist in my spare time. Um, and you know, it, it, you, you have to understand a new terminology. There's a lot of buzzwords around it. And I was looking at like a, a consumer sort of finance style uh, proposition from a, a cryptocurrency um, sort of uh, area. And they were trying to basically position like these homeowner loans, um, which is a, what in the US they kind of call mortgages in a certain, certain light. Um, so they were trying to position these homeowner loans and within like the first half a page was all these like crazy cryptocurrency terms that you think someone who wants to buy a house with some money is, is just not going to understand any of that. And it was talking about, oh, download MetaMask, which if you know what, what, know what cryptocurrencies are, that means a whole ton of things to you. If you want to buy a house, on average, it's not going to mean anything to you. So they were, trying, they were in this really difficult niche trying to pitch something to a very small group of people um, as a financial product. So the barrier to entry is high. Um, you know, 
you, you, can't, you, you can't go and like, deploy your own smart contracts without being a developer, for example. And that's really important. On the flip side, open banking probably wins quite nicely on, um, on the consumer friendliness. It, it kind of hides in the background. The, the, how open banking works is it's an open uh, API interface based on a, a, something called the financial API standard, which is uh, a derivative of OpenID Connect and OAuth 2. Um, so it kind of disappears in the background. You don't know any of that technology. All you know is that you've got the opportunity to share some of your data or complete a payment in a digital journey. Um, and so like, the barrier to entry is much lower. People can start to position these products uh, in a way that is more consumer-centric. You don't have to know the ins and outs of an API call to, to, to be part of that ecosystem. OK, that's cool. Um, however, the concept of sharing financial information has been quite a difficult one <laughs> to get into the consumer world because what do we do with what do financial companies do all the time they warn you about phishing they tell you they never ask for account details they tell you they won't share your data with anybody right we are trained we are we are training people particularly non-financially savvy people uh, not to do this thing and then we come along and say oh well actually we can do it but only this way and they can't distinguish between those two things and people are not really very well equipped at the minute to distinguish between the thing that they should be doing and the thing that they shouldn't be doing um, so whilst there's a great opportunity for consumer friendliness in some of this stuff, it's, it's designed to be hidden away, non-technical non -technical focus, um, actually convincing consumers has been a real big challenge of open banking. Actually, okay, so it's not a good winner in this space. Smash the monopoly. Uh, you know, we did, talked about Visa MasterCard at the start. Uh, they have a monopoly in that space. But actually, you could look at regulation as a bit of a monopoly, right? If you want to start a bank in the UK at the minute, you probably need minimum 10 million to get started and then a whole lot more to really get going like there's a very very high bar to entry and so innovation is going to be tight right it's gonna be really hard um and that's because of the regulation but then the regulation is there of course to protect you as well so it's this balance between the two the two extremes so let's uh, compare and contrast again we'll start with open banking this time um so open banking is highly regulated it, it did come from legislation so naturally it's going to be regulated um, what you tend to find that means with regulation is that you don't get a straight answer all the time. Um, the reg regulators are notorious for not telling you what they really want. You have to really figure it out. And some people get really frustrated by that, but it's actually deliberate. The whole point is to create gotcha opportunities. And that's not to make life difficult for anybody. It's to make sure that you know, um, the regulator is in the right position of power. That's how regulation works. Um, and you know, because of this, Open banking has struggled to get started, right? There's a whole lot of personal finance managers, things like Snoop, um, you know, various, various other apps that are out there. But there's only so many ways that you can oh, bring all of your financial uh, products together and uh, get some advice on how to better manage your finances. It's kind of just the same thing regurgitated over and over again. And personal finance management data sharing was not the main purpose of PSD2 and open banking. That wasn't the purpose of it. Payments was the absolute purpose. Uh, that was the real point. Um, the problem that you've got with payments is there's an existing monopoly out there and they don't like it when you come along and try and innovate in their space. So you've recently have seen there's some big suppliers in the open banking space, like for example, Tink, recently bought by Visa for quite a lot of money. Um, you know, so the, the opportunity of innovation was there, but it can be very quickly cut off at the top by, by the large monopolies if they want to. So, you know, let's go on to De DeFi on the monopoly side. Well. You know, ignoring the technical bar, you can create a finance product tonight in your bedroom if you really, really want to. You can create a, a coin, you can put it out there, you can sell it. Uh, it's relatively trivial to do. Um, if you want to do it properly, there is some cost. You know, you probably want to get a lawyer involved. You probably want to be sure that you're not scamming anybody, or at least not look that way. Um, but, but if you didn't want to do all those things, the cost can be effectively zero for making a finance product which creates a bit of an anarchic situation, but fundamentally there can't be any monopolies, right? Because anyone can come along and just reproduce what you've done and do it better and do something different. And we've seen that in the Bitcoin ecosystem, in the Ethereum ecosystem, all these, uh, this proliferation of all sorts of different things. Standardization, which is kind of like the opposite of, you know, monopolies um, in some respects, like, do, do, we want to, do we want standards or do we want innovation? Which way do we want to go? Um, so, you know, 
I talked a little bit then about DeFi being in the proliferation stage. We're absolutely seeing that. There is like core technologies that become more and more standardized. And I think the standardization is just because there's only so much anarchy people can take, right? You can't keep reinventing the world. There's the, the famous adage, I've got 99 standards. We should standardize all of that to one thing. Now I've got 100 standards. We should standardize and, and so on and so on and so on. So naturally people do tend towards sort of like commonality in some respects. But because of the level of proliferation, interoperability is a problem. There are actually cryptocurrency products, uh, blockchain products that are designed, say Uniswap, for example, that are designed to create interoperability between different blockchains, between different cryptocurrencies. Um, and the, the, old, the only purpose these things could have to exist is because there's an interoperability problem. Flip over to open banking. I mean, it's fundamentally a standard, so it is standardized, you would think. Uh, but of course, when you've got multiple large enterprise organizations, which is really the people that, uh, implementing these APIs, there is going to be variation. There's going to be, uh, you know, people doing things in different ways. The standards are not easy and simple by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I'd consider myself something of an expert in them, um, but, you know, you could definitely very quickly ask me a question I don't know the answer to. Um, you know, and I have to go and look it up and look through it. Um, there's one person I do know who works for me who does seem to know them in a nice encyclopedic fashion, but I'm pretty certain that he, you know, he literally dreams in, in open banking. So it's not easy, you know, and changing standards is hard, right? If you want to change the open banking standard, you have to do an RFC. You have to go through a vote process. You have to go through, can I convince Lloyds and HSBC this is a good thing to do? And believe me, convincing large enterprise banks that they need to change something is not an easy thing. Uh, but at the core, strong interoperability is, a, is, a, is, a, is the whole point of it. Right? There's, a, there's an open standard, an open uh, community that's designed for it to be, if you meet the regulatory standards, and if you meet a certain another set of standards, you've got access and you should be able to relatively trivially integrate with pretty much everyone in the UK market. Security, how are we doing for time? We're doing all right for time, that's good. Uh, so safety first, security, and this is the one where we're gonna have loads of fun with crypto. Uh, so obviously DeFi is a bit of a wild west. I mean, that's the point, we're trying to smash a monopoly here. Um, you know, we can't, you know, have too much regulation and too much insight. I mean, in theory, this is all good because it's an open distributed ledger. You can review the code, you can audit what goes before, but we've gone a long way from the original Bitcoin days with, you know, a single blockchain, you know, you could audit the, the algorithm, you know, everyone was running versions of, of, the, of the miner. In the Ethereum world with smart contracts, you know, um, it's a, it, it's a lot harder and you actually have to be technically savvy yourself. So I've got tons of stories, like I have a whole list of stories that I could have gone through. Last night, uh, I was reading an article about the Compound Token who accidentally rolled out a, a bug in their latest version, distributed $90 million worth of uh, their own currency to uh, the ecosystem, totally by accident. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, th the response to that was the, uh, the founder going on Twitter uh, threatening to uh, to out everybody that had received these tokens if they didn't send it back. Interesting, interesting uh, approach. But you know, we've also had articles recently about Coinbase and the breach that happened there. You know, the, uh, the 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 blockchains are open; they're auditable. The smart contracts can be audited. Um, but if you're not personally technically savvy, people can still get you NFTs. There's a common um, common Twitter threads I see of people losing NFTs because they've accepted a free one from someone and built into the smart contract is something that gives you access, gives them access to your wallet and to your NFTs and suddenly away they go with, with all of your, your artwork. Um, so, you know, theoretically it's all really good, um, but because of the complexity and because, you know, the technical savviness now of people actually being part of this ecosystem is starting to lower slightly, um, there's plenty of edges for criminals to exploit. Um, open banking, on the other hand, well, you know, it's a pretty sh good, sh strong trust framework. Um, they have done a good security order, audit on it. I would trust it, and I'm a bit of a cynic, so that's pretty good. Um, so you'd think that, that they win really well here, because the standardization really comes through, and fundamentally, you're relying, still relying on the financial institutions, fraud and protection, security controls. A, a big part of the open banking 
uh, legislation, PSD2 legislation, was something called secure customer authentication. You'll all have experienced that if you use a bank in the UK, because over the last sort of three or four years, you will have gone from uh, crappy password logins or whatever to highly complicated uh, one-time passcodes, behavior biometrics, um, you know, more complex and secure login capabilities, um, things like, um, you know, uh, some, some banks are now implementing WebAuthn and things like that. And all of that was really driven and mandated by the same standard that underpins the open banking proliferation. So that all sounds really, really good. And banks tend to have pretty good fraud controls. A lot of the stuff that, uh, a lot of the problems that banks face from a fraud point of view is kind of around, around social engineering and, and stuff like that. Um, you're at least no worse than you were. However, who protects, you have the stable door problem. Who protects the data after it's left the bank? And you've now suddenly got all these uh, suppliers you know, uh, that are integrating with banks, integrating with the personal finance managers. You've got all these personal finance management companies. Some of them are selling your data on, right? And the legislation doesn't touch that. It doesn't cover that uh, directly in any way. So this is lovely secure API standard between your bank and whoever you're sharing the data with, um, but there's nothing that wraps around the data after it's left that uh, safe, safe place. Um, so actually, there are some areas where this is still risky, um, particularly around you know, losing some of, uh, some of the you know, transaction data, anything that could be kind of like identifying, um, so we quite, get quite worried about like, the fraud angle of the more someone knows about you, the easier that they can pretend to be so, where next? Hopefully perfectly on time. Uh, regulation is next. I mean, that is the reality of any financial product. Um, I think there was always this feeling that cryptocurrencies would somehow break through and avoid all the regulation, but the reality is it's not going to happen. I talked about the Coinbase, Coinbase breach a little while ago, um, a little earlier. They had to publish something quite recently about that breach because it was a, a, a data protection issue, a data privacy issue. Um, so they were hit by legislation, even though their, their products and things not, aren't necessarily legislated in other ways. So crypto is going to get regulated. Look at China. China's banned a number of cryptocurrencies. They are heavily starting to regulate it. It is going to happen everywhere else, um, is the reality of it. And the reason is because there's a lot of money in it, and there's a lot of risk for people. Uh, and if you're a real cynic, uh, there's a, lack, a, a loss of control by the central government as well. But I'll let you make a decision about what the motivations are. On the flip side, open banking is going to get more regulated as well because it's not really hit its original goals. There hasn't been the proliferation of payment products that we'd wanted to see probably in the market. That's really frustrating for anyone involved in open banking. That's always been super frustrating. Um, like the dream at the time, I remember sitting down talking with one of the product owners at work at the time and we talked about a future where financial services companies could become almost fully white labeled and you would allow a proliferation of uh, companies that offered your product or your product was backing what they offered and that they could innovate on the consumer side. They could add, they could add um, oh, can we combine a credit card with a, let's say, a loan or a credit card with a, an insurance product or something crazy like that. I'm, you know, I'm terrible at thinking of ideas like that, but I'm sure there's some really smart people who could have done something cool there. Um, but we haven't got to that because there's been a ton of resistance for change in the industry, um, that's for sure. And so you know, there is an appetite to fix that. And the only way that, that we know how to fix it in this industry is to regulate more and more. And so there's more consultations happening. Since we left uh, the European Union, it's still happening because a lot of the legislation was driven by, uh, by the, the UK finance sector. Um, so a lot of that is, uh, is still gonna come through the pipeline. All right, brilliant. I've got the five minute warning and I've finished. That was exactly on time almost like I'd practiced it, which I didn't. So that's good. Uh, it's been a busy week. So uh, thank you very much. You can find me at that handle on uh, Twitter, Hacker News, LinkedIn, anywhere that you get your favorite social medias. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Hopefully I've uh, not uh, upset you too much by not denouncing a winner at the end. Thank you very much.